It's September 16, 2011. Quebecois gangster Renaud Desjardins would be driving his SUV in Lavelle, a suburb of Montreal. While out on the road, however, another vehicle would open fire on him, numerous bullets penetrating his front windshield. Remarkably enough, he managed to get out of the assassination attempt completely unscathed. This wouldn't be the first, however, nor the last gang-related murder attempt the city of Montreal would see, as the once powerful criminal organizations who controlled it would go through an era of major restructuring as the country itself would pass the turn of the century. You know, Dad, you know, we have the hiccups for the first time since the 17th. What? Have the hiccups. Oh, yeah. <laughs> They got me fucking golfing in a cold day today. I don't even golf. Oh, what, the gentleman? I'm in demo, like I'm freezing. It's freezing up here. Yeah, Nate, here. How are you? How are you, my Good, yeah, good. I just left the message before yeah, I missed I know, your call. I know. Filippo didn't give you the messages. No, no. And I, hey, you know what? The year is 1911. Vincenzo Catroni is born in Mamola, a small municipality in the southern Italian province of Calabria. When he was young, Vincenzo's family would immigrate to the United States, and when he was 13, to Montreal, Canada. Montreal is one of Canada's largest cities and a main harbor in the province of Quebec. Founded as a trading post in 1611 by Samuel de Champlain, Montreal was originally called La Place Royale and would grow to become the bustling city that it is now. Vincenzo would come to Montreal in 1924 alongside his two sisters and brother Giuseppe. His mother would give birth to two more sons while living in their new home. Cotroni, also known as the Egg, was considered illiterate as he grew up and as such, the spelling of his name is a matter of questionability. Cotroni would become the most accepted form, however. Vincenzo's father, Nicodemo, worked as a carpenter as their family settled in a poor Italian neighborhood in Montreal. As the city entered the 1920s, Montreal would find itself immune to the Prohibition-era policymaking and as such, became a central port for American bootleggers to smuggle then-banned product into the United States, and Cotroni would soon enter this illegal business and make a name for himself. The man never actually went to school, which would explain his illiteracy. He instead opted to follow his father and become a carpenter, and later a professional wrestler by the stage name of Vic Vincent. As the 1930s rolled around and Catroni turned 20, he had already built up a heavy rap sheet with offenses such as theft, assault, and more. He'd also been caught engaging in bootlegging alongside Armand Corville, a known Canadian gangster. Corville was a working-class child who attended a Montreal Catholic school, growing a known name as a wrestler. He would open a wrestling school named Club St. Paul de Ville, using his skills to teach amateur wrestlers, one of whom was Vincenzo Cotroni. However, even as a successful wrestler, Corville also engaged in criminal activity, namely gambling and bootlegging. Working alongside then-petty thief Cotroni, the two Montrealites would start a successful alcohol operation, with Corville himself using his intimidating physique and combat skills to keep the arms of the law away. The two gangsters became close friends due to this shared characteristic. Montreal would enter an era known as the interwar period, the two decades between the end of World War I and the beginning of World War II, and it would become a uniquely violent territory. The city saw itself the center for drug trafficking, bootlegging operations, illegal gambling, and prostitution, which was good for Cotroni. He saw his career as a criminal grow through his employment as a bouncer at underground clubs and bars across the city. He was a strong fan of the Indrangheta clan of Calabria an Italian subculture that promoted aggression and dominance in numerous facets. The Indrangentisti of Italy and Europe promoted a gang-like style of living that influenced Cotroni's actions and general way of life. Cotroni's work in organized crime would lead him to accepting muscle jobs for numerous Quebec political parties, taking part in what were known at the time as baseball bat elections. In order to sway an election, men like Cotroni would attack rival supporters and rig ballot boxes in their employer's favor. He and his family, in turn, would see support and protection from Quebec's political structure. The further Cotroni entered into crime, the more lavish his lifestyle would become, and he would retire from professional wrestling 
in 38, keeping his stage name. In 41, Catroni would open up two clubs alongside Corville, one being a bar. The Faison d'Or, one of these two places, became the city's most lively nightclub for decades. Both men would see their reputations shift from thugs to French cultural promoters in a time when the Quebecois felt their culture was being treaded on by the rest of Canada. The two men would work alongside each other to run the city's crime rackets in Canada's Sin City. By this point in time, Montreal was considered the third most depraved place in the world. The two Montrealites' quick success would attract two famous New York gangsters, Lucky Luciano, the first boss of the Genovese family and founder of the American Commission, and Meyer Lansky, a powerful Jewish mobster who worked alongside Luciano. The two men wanted a piece of the new Sin City, and as such, Cotroni would begin employing regional gangsters to smuggle heroin from France to Montreal, and then to the United States, where the demand for the illicit product was noticeably higher. This new association would birth a friendship between the Canadian and the American, and in the 1950s, Cotroni's quickly growing crime syndicate would align with New York's Bonanno family. In 1952, the Bonanno family's Carmine Galante would travel to Montreal and begin setting up lucrative business deals with Cotroni. His vision was to turn the city into the ideal place for heroin distribution across the United States. While in this city, Galante would also set up gambling rackets that earned him over 50 million per year. By associating with Galante, Catroni's reputation grew and he became the head lieutenant of the Bonanno family's Montreal branch. Alongside heroin, the family also used Montreal's ports to move Central Asian opium with help from French and Turkish gangsters. However, disaster would strike for Galante in 1954. That year, a new reformist politician named Jean Drapeau would win Montreal's mayoral election, despite Catroni's best efforts to steer and rig the vote. The new mayor would swiftly appoint Pacifique Plante as the city's new police chief, as he himself was an avid crime fighter. As a result of this, however, Galante, who'd been living in Montreal at the time, was deported back to New York due to his illegal operations. His role in the city was swiftly replaced, with little Sal Giglio, a big name in the family. Now under Giglio, the Catroni clan would work with the Union Nationale Party to oust Drapeau. Numerous attempts at intimidation were made by the gangsters, including one scenario where Catroni soldiers tried running the candidate over in the street. Montreal's Civic Action League head, Ruben Levesque, was beaten down by Catroni gangsters in the middle of public as well. After rigging the city's election with some two thousand ballots, Catroni's candidate, Sarto Fournier, would become the new mayor. Catroni's power and infamy would only grow from here. Mr. Catroni, it has been alleged that you are the head of the Montreal Mafia. Oh, no. I'm the head of nobody. I'm the head of myself. Well, they've, they've said that you are the god. Sarto Fournier, Montreal's newest mayor, would immediately get rid of Pacifique Plante, the city's then chief of police. Plante was appointed as an incorruptible candidate by the former mayor, and, being a strong ally to the city's gang world, Fournier needed the man gone. Plante, who supposedly had a hit contract placed on him, would flee to Mexico. Then, Giglio would see a similar fate that Galante saw when he too was deported to the United States, only two years after taking over. The reason? 240 Cuban cigars, which he never declared at the customs office after returning from a vacation in Cuba. Catroni would then become the official agent, taking over the city and establishing his family as the number one power in Montreal, and he became a rich man. By this point, however, he was approaching his 50s and as such moved enforcement work onto his brother Frank, who was still in his 20s. Frank was very much like the younger Catroni and as such was perfect for the job. Other brother Giuseppe was found guilty in the early 60s for his role in the heroin trafficking rackets in a major bank robbery in Montreal. As the 1960s rolled around, Cotroni was the staunch opposite of his earlier self, going from a small immigrant neighborhood to two new homes in and around Montreal. In 1964, Catroni, who was still an arm of the Bonanno family of New York, 
was split in two when his boss, Joe Bananas Banano, had a falling out with the commission, which he originally was a founder of. He planned to whack the bosses of the Gambino, Lucchese, and Buffalo families in order to seize control of the governing board, and when the commission called him into a meeting, he ran to Montreal. This of course was an issue for Catroni, who served both Bonanno and the commission. In order to ease tensions, the commission forgave Bonanno and sent Sam the Plumber de Cavalcante to bring Bonanno back. De Cavalcante was the boss of North Jersey's crime family. Bonanno, living in Montreal, also posed another issue for Catroni. Buffalo. Life could be a dream. Life could be the Magadino family of Buffalo, New York, was afraid that Bonanno's presence in Canada meant that he planned to expand into Ontario, which was Buffalo's territory. They gave Catroni an ultimatum. It was either Bonanno or him. As tensions grew, however, Catroni finally got out of the conflict when Bonanno was deported to the United States later that year. As a rifting faction of the Bonanno family, led by Capo Regina Gaspar de Gregorio, grew against Bonanno, Catroni saw himself as part of a family divide. It was noted by De Cavalcante and Jonah Taro, a Bonanno associate, that Catroni still aligned with his former boss. On the 28th of November 1966, a group of NYC mafiosos, led by Salvatore Bonanno, Bonanno's son, would travel to Montreal to speak with Catroni regarding Montreal's Expo 67 event. While in town, police would pull over Bonanno's car and find three loaded handguns. The party was deported back to the US, and when Buffalo's Magadino learned about their plan to speak with Vic from Montreal, he grew furious. He wanted to speak with Catroni in Buffalo, but the man would decline. Magadino began to form plans to whack Montreal's boss, until Giacomo Lupino would step in. Lupino was the then boss of Hamilton, Ontario, and aligned with the Italians in Buffalo. He managed to mediate an agreement between both parties. Magadino would leave Catroni B, and in exchange, his son-in-law Paolo Violi would become the underboss of Montreal. Magadino liked this move as it weakened Bonanno's hold over Montreal, and Violi liked the move as he disliked Magadino. He believed that the Catroni family should have declared itself an independent syndicate. The conflict between Buffalo and Montreal, however, was finally put to peace. Corville, Catroni's close friend, mentor, and lieutenant, would continue promoting wrestling and sold tainted, inedible meats at Expo 67. His expired meat operation, Reggio Foods, was shut down in 1975 after an investigation declared it the number one distributor of rancid meat in Canada. Corville would eventually recruit his nephew Real to work as a hitman for Frank Catroni in the 1970s, and Corville himself passed away in 1991. Unlike many of the men in these stories, he would pass away a rich and free man. The Catroni family was unique in the way that they made official members. At the time, family memberships in Italian syndicates were limited to not just ethnic background, but geographical as well. Catroni paid no mind to this tradition, however, and had both Sicilians and Calabrians inducted. By the late 1960s, his crime syndicate was running each region of Montreal. Montreal West was run by a Sicilian man named Luigi Greco, while Saint Laurent was run by Francesco Catroni. Paolo Violi was the family's second-in-command, while Corville was a main lieutenant. William Obrant, a Canadian man, was the family's chief money launderer and grew a reputation as Canada's own Meyer Lansky, as he was heavily engaged in financial fraud. At one point during this time, the Catroni family fell into conflict with Richard Blass, a violent Quebecois gang leader and hitman for the West End Gang. He resented the fact that the Italian immigrants had taken over the city's underworld and wanted to get back at them. On May 7 of 1968, Blass and an associate of his would attempt to attack Frank Catroni outside of his home in Montreal, killing the man's two bodyguards. Frank was able to escape, but this offense wouldn't be forgotten. On August 24 of that same year, two Catroni hitmen would enter a bar where Blass was spotted. They entered the building and opened fire on the Frenchman, but missed every shot. Blass managed to get out of there unharmed. 
About half a month later, the mafiosos learned that Blast was hiding out in a suburban motel, and they set it on fire. Of the three people that died in the fire, Blass was not one of them. Then, in October of 1968, Catroni associate Joe DiMalo would catch Blass inside a garage and open fire on him. Blass had bullets lodged in his back and head, yet managed to survive yet again. He went to the hospital for his wounds, but refused to cooperate with the authorities, which earned him a badge of respect from the Italians. The war, of course, between Blass and the Italians would continue, and they would kill a few more of his men. On October 16 of 1969, while in prison for the murder of a police officer during a botched robbery, Blass and a number of other prisoners would attack a guard and steal the court transport van, escaping custody. He was ratted out by an anonymous caller, and police found him secretly hiding in his wife's apartment. In 1974, Blass's friend would smuggle firearms into the prison, and he escaped yet again, going on a revenge-induced rampage. He wanted to take out the former members of his gang who turned on him, and killed them in a bar on October 30th of 1974. A few months later, he returned to the same facility and murdered another gangster, alongside 13 innocent civilians who were witnesses to the shooting. After a shootout with police in the early hours of January 24th, 1975, Blass was shot to death 27 times, ending his story. Blass's wave of violence had led to deaths in the mass numbers. Between 1963 and 69, reported 110 gang-related deaths were conducted, with 70 happening in 1968 alone. Catroni, however, would continue with his illegal operations, running a massive bookmaking operation with Paolo Violi. William Obron would land the family numerous contracts to sell Corville's tainted meat at the Expo 67 event in Montreal. However, the financial financial scam artist was charged in 73 with tax fraud, getting a 20-month sentence and a heavy fine. That same year, Catroni himself was imprisoned for contempt of court when he was subpoenaed by the city's organized crime committee. And with the Calabrian now behind bars, his younger second-in-command, Paolo Violi, would become the new boss. However, something bad was brewing within the family's Sicilian faction, and it would spell the end for both Violi and Catroni's reign over Montreal. It's February 18, 1924. Maria Renda Rizzuto would give birth to her son, Niccolo. He was born in Catalica Ereclea in Sicily. Niccolo's father, Vito Rizzuto, following his birth, would legally immigrate to the United States, alongside his brother-in-law, Calogero Renda. Maria would stay in Sicily to raise her son, while her husband earned the family money overseas. However, on August 12th of 1933, at just nine years old, Niccolo would lose his father and his mother would remarry. On March 20th of 1945, Rizzuto would marry Libertina Mano. Mano was the daughter of Antonio Mano, who was Eric Lea's Sicilian Mafia captain. Then, on February 21st of 1946, Libertina would give birth to their son Vito. About eight years later, the Rizzuto family would immigrate to Canada and settle in Montreal. Using his gang connections from the old country, Rizzuto would establish a crime syndicate in the city. In mid-64, Antonio Mano would move to Montreal and join his son-in-law as associates in the then-established Catroni family. As members of the family, Niccolo and his associates dealt heavily in drug trafficking, which earned them a lavish and profitable lifestyle. As the 1970s rolled around, Rizzuto was a member of the Catroni family's Sicilian faction, working under Paolo Violi. Violi was born in Calabria in 1931, being part of a mob family. His father, Domenico, was the boss of an Indrangheta faction in their hometown. In 1951, now almost 20, Violi would immigrate to Ontario, settling around Toronto, where he would begin his Canadian criminal career. In the 1960s, he would begin an legal liquor operation in Ontario, moving his product into Quebec, before conflict would arise between him and the Hamilton mob. Although he was an associate of Giacomo Lupino, the boss of the Lupino family, he feared that Violi's work would clash with the Papalia family, also based in Hamilton. As such, Violi would move to Montreal. 
Now in Montreal, Violi would marry Grazia Lupino, his old boss's daughter, and Vincenzo Cotroni was his best man. He opened up a bar in St. Leonard under Cotroni and used the place as the headquarters for his extortion operations. However, he was an ambitious man and knew from the beginning that he'd take over the family. He saw Catroni as a weak leader, quite literally describing him as such to Lupino during a phone call one night. He was disrespectful to the Bonanno family, and due to his aggressive and isolationist nature, other gangsters grew to dislike him. In December of 1970, Violi's bar was bugged by wiretaps placed by Robert Menard. Menard was an undercover police officer who rented an apartment above the bar for five years, going by a fake alias. For the first two years above the bar, the two men rarely spoke, but one day out of the blue, Violi would invite Menard to lunch, and the two men became connected. During his Saturday morning conversations with the gangster, the officer learned that Violi was a smart but ruthless man, as well as a strong Canadian nationalist who resented the Quebecois separatist movement. He also noted that Violi was a neighborhood boss in St. Leonard, almost like a godfather back in the old country and as such, both Violi and Menard were subject to heavy respect from the people living there. However, as respected as he was, he still had a complete disregard for human life. In one situation, gangsters in the Quebecois Popeye's Motor Club killed almost 10 members of the Catroni family for upselling poor quality heroin. Violi wanted the entire gang killed off, and Frank Catroni was tasked with the hit. However, Frank spent a heavy amount of time planning each detail so that innocent bystanders or civilians weren't killed, and never did the hit as a result. This angered Violi. His idea, more so, was to simply enter the bike club and kill everyone inside, civilian or not. Eventually, the conflict was settled with a sit-down, but Violi continued to express his anger towards Frank. Violi and Menard continued to get closer as the years went by, and Menard would go to great lengths to keep his identity a secret, even faking being an electrician. Eventually, after his investigation had concluded, he was revealed to be an undercover cop. Violi's reaction to the information was one of deep respect. He was quoted telling his crew, He's a stand-up guy. He's a better f***ing soldier than the rest of you. Now back to Rizzuto. The two tribal factions of the Cotroni family, the Sicilians and the Calabrians, would see a violent power struggle form in 1973 as both sides wanted control of the syndicate. Violi complained often regarding the independent nature of his Sicilian counterparts, most often commenting on Niccolo Rizzuto. When he went to the commission to get permission to whack Niccolo, he was turned down. In 1975, now the acting boss of the family, Violi was indicted on a CECHO extortion case, the Quebec equivalent of an American RICO case, and it heavily damaged his reputation. During his trial, numerous Italian businessmen from St. Leonard were called witness and testified against Violi, exposing his violent and careless business practices. One family, which had been running a business for over a decade and a half by that point, had been forced into bankruptcy and practical starvation by Violi's extortion operations. During the case of Violi soldier, Peter Bianco would flip to the crown and testify against his boss, stating that his main job was to rob wedding parties while the guests were in the church house. The reason for his betrayal? Violi was caught insulting him over wiretap. In fact, numerous wiretaps were played to the court. In one of them, Violi was caught admitting right to Catroni that he'd attempted to murder a man by firing at him three times in the head. Although the victim survived, he remained crippled, which Violi boasted about. He even revealed the handgun he'd used. However, he wasn't the killer to begin with. Violi was a known braggart who often took responsibility for things he'd never done, and this was one of them. He would either need to take responsibility for something he didn't do and face jail time, or risk revealing he'd lied right to his boss, which spelt death for him. As he sat in court, Violi gloomily heard wiretap after wiretap of him backbiting, gossiping, threatening, and boasting. 
The court's evidence not only made him look foolish, but also two-faced, as he was commonly taped insulting both his boss and the New York bosses on numerous occasions. The biggest insult to his associates, however, was how hypocritical he was. He had his own soldiers steal from Italians in Little Italy, and sacked numerous weddings that he himself attended. As described by Peter Edwards of the Toronto Star, Violi's actions deprived St. Leonard's children of gifts at Christmas. Violi was a traitor to his own people. In 1976, the Rizzuto clan would take advantage of the turbulent landscape and whack Pietro Shara, Violi's second in command. Ironically enough, he was killed after watching a showing of the Godfather with his wife. Sharo was killed for betraying Rizzuto and siding with Violi. The whack job would blow the man's head open and leave his wife injured. On February 8 of the following year, Francesco Violi, an enforcer and Paolo's brother, was shotgunned to death. That night, Francesco would be sitting in his office at an importing company that he ran when two men wearing ski masks would enter the facility and kill him at the age of just 38. Then, Christmas of 1977 came around. Just before the festivities began, Vito Rizzuto, Niccolo's son, and Violi would meet at the home of a known Montreal resident. There, they began a series of peace talks which ultimately failed, leading to the Rizzuto clan to flee to Venezuela. As they hid out there, they directed their soldiers and loyalists to continue murdering in their name. On January 22, 1978, Paolo Violi was shot in the head at his old bar. He'd sold the bar a while back, but he still went there on occasion. That night, two men wearing ski masks would enter the building and aggressively move towards Violi. His funeral was held only five days later, and very few people actually went. Catroni was one of the few people who went, but because he'd been forced by New York to accept the hit job against Violi, he didn't speak to the family of the victim. The Rizzuto family's hits by this point had been marked by excessive brutality and a disregard of tradition. The preference for shotguns left each of their victims disfigured. By the early 1980s, Rizzuto had more power than before, and it was safe to return. Both Niccolo and his son purchased lavish mansions on Goyne Boulevard near Lavelle. At one point in time, this street was populated almost exclusively by Rizzuto-oriented mafiosi, and it got the nickname Mafia Road. The Rizzuto clan took an opposite approach to Violi, laying low and keeping quiet. They had strong connections across Europe and South America due to Niccolo Rizzuto's alliance with the Contera Carauna clan, who were based back in the old country. It was now accepted that Niccolo Rizzuto was the new boss of Montreal's criminal landscape. It's 1981. The city of Montreal has just undergone a brutal mob war characterized by brutality and bloodshed. The Sicilian faction of the city's largest crime syndicate has emerged victorious, and the Rizzuto clan is now in charge. With Niccolo Rizzuto serving as the new boss, the mob begins to stretch its influence across the region, and the men in charge begin to lead lavish lives. Rizzuto's son Vito, now in his mid-thirties, works closely alongside his father as a crucial element of the family. Only two years prior, New York mob boss Carmine Galante was shot to death at a Brooklyn restaurant. At the time, Galante was the acting boss to the Bonanno crime family, and as the boss, he began a bloody campaign against the Gambino family to control the city's illegal narcotics trade, killing eight men in the process. As a result, the boss of the Genovese family, Frank Thierry, got approval from numerous other leaders, including the old boss of the Bonanno family, to kill Galante. On July 12th of that year, three men in ski masks would walk onto the outdoor terrace of a Brooklyn restaurant and murder Galante, his cousin and a loyal captain of his. It was over for the man, and Big Joe Messino would begin a power grab alongside family capo regime Sonny Black Napolitano. However, the two men felt threatened by a small mutinous faction of the family made up of Dominic Trinchera, Philip Giacone, and Alfonso Indelicato. 
These men wanted control of the family, and at some point in 1981, Messino received some damning information. The three captains were stockpiling automatic weapons, likely anticipating a brutal street war. Fellow bosses Carmine Persico and Paul Castellano told Messino to defend himself immediately. Around that time, Vito Rizzuto would be invited down to a wedding held by a Bonanno associate in New York and the Messino faction would set their plan into action. Messino, along with four associates, would arrange to meet the rebellious captains at the 2020 nightclub in Brooklyn to make a peace treaty before things got violent. Now in the club, Messino had four gunmen hide in a closet out of view. These men were Salvatore Vitale, Vito Rizzuto, Emmanuel Ragusa, and one more Rizzuto soldier. Then, the three men, along with their bodyguard, Frank Lino, arrived at the scene. One of Messino's associates, Gerlando Shasha, had come up with a signal for the gunmen beforehand. He discreetly run his hand through his hair, and the young Rizzuto and his fellow hitmen would quickly exit the closet, wearing ski masks and brandishing submachine guns. Following their exit, Rizzuto would yell, quote, It's a holdup. As Messino began physically knocking the captains down, the first to go was Giacone, who was mowed down by the gunfire. The other two men would suffer the same fate. As this was allegedly supposed to be a peace meeting, they were completely unarmed. John Gotti, then a capo in the Gambino family, helped arrange for the bodies to be buried in Queens as a favor to Messino. And with the men gone, Messino was now the official boss of the Bonanno family. But more importantly, Vito Rizzuto had earned himself a name, and his show of loyalty to the family would not be forgotten. It's August 2nd of 1988. Nicola Rizzuto is staying at his residence in Venezuela. That day, however, authorities would search the home and find over 700 grams of cocaine there, leading to the boss getting an eight-year sentence, although he was paroled in 1993. However, with Nicolo in prison in a completely different country, the Rizzuto family needed a new boss, and who better than his rich, powerful, and feared son Vito. In 1987, a massive shipment of hashish was found off the coast of Newfoundland by the RCMP, 16 tons to be exact. Rizzuto was arrested along with his second-in-command, Renald Desjardins. Desjardins was a major figure in the city's drug trade and was considered by authorities as the most influential non-Italian in the mob. In 1990, Rizzuto's trial began, but the charges were dropped after the RCMP legally overstepped their investigation. He was arrested later that year regardless for a similar crime. One of the men involved in the second case, Normand Dupuis, was a drug dealer who was willing to cooperate operate with authorities as much as necessary, in exchange for compensation and witness protection. Rizzuto's lawyer, Jean Salois, quickly bribed the dealer with $1 million, however. Salois secretly recorded this conversation. He purposefully turned it over to authorities and had Dupuis charged with obstruction of justice. Rizzuto was granted an acquittal as a result. Each charge placed on Rizzuto refused to stick to him, and he would quickly get the nickname Canada's Teflon Don, hearkening back to New York's infamous mob boss John Gotti. Vito began to lead a lavish life, often appearing in the media. He went to major boxing matches across Montreal, getting him and his celebrity-level entourage the best seats he could. He'd constantly be seen with numerous bodyguards walking around him and women on both sides. Rizzuto was making insane levels of money from the rackets he ran, and he loved the exposure it got him. In fact, unlike many of the New York families, Rizzuto didn't have the same restrictions they had. He himself was heavy in the drug trade, as an example. Every vice he could exploit, he did. And across the 1980s and 90s, Montreal became a hub for crime. If you needed something under the table, Montreal was the place to be and Rizzuto was the man you needed. Under him, the Montreal organization was dubbed the Sixth Family. But then, 2004 would come around. 
Big Joe Messino, the boss of the Bonanno family and friend to Rizzuto, receives the death penalty and in a shocking move turns state's evidence. He's the largest crime figure in American history to do so. Rizzuto was indicted on several racketeering charges which included his role in the Three Capos murder. On January 20 of that year, Rizzuto was arrested in Montreal and entered a long legal battle that lasted two years. In 2006, he was extradited for trial to the United States, appearing at the Eastern District Court in Brooklyn. A year later, he pleaded guilty to conspiracy to commit murder and got a 10-year sentence with a three-year-long supervised release period. Yes, he went to prison, but considering what he'd done, he got incredibly lucky. Canada's Teflon Dawn struck yet again. When Vito was out of the game, the family needed an acting boss to take command, and as such, Niccolo was reinstated. Niccolo, now 81, would become the new patriarch to the Rizzuto crime syndicate, and he began to lay low after the overexposure they received by Vito's hand. It was discovered by the RCMP around this time that the family had been basing all of their operations out of one place, a small Italian cafe in St. Jerome, Quebec. This cafe, named the Consenza Social Club, was the family's headquarters where all business-associated things were done. In the back of the building were two small offices. In one, general business was held, inquiries, favors, and negotiations. The other office, however, was where the crucial things were done. Here, money was passed around, hits were okayed, and private meetings were held. The RCMP would begin to lay the foundation for Project Colise, their largest investigation to date. They discovered one day that during the hours of the night, the Consenza was completely unguarded and they would use this to their advantage. Canadian authorities would sneak in one day and plant wiretaps across the entire building. Although Rizzuto had the place checked weekly after finding a bug hiding in a couch one day, they never found the wiretaps that the feds had placed. As the family unknowingly underwent their day-to-day -day operations, the RCMP was watching every single conversation. With Vito gone, on, a violent power grab would begin to form under Niccolo. He was seen at the Consenza's back room every day, settling disputes and receiving massive cuts from every racket that he ran. Members of other regional gangs, like the Hells Angels, were often spotted there giving tributes to Rizzuto in exchange for operating in his territory. Of the many positives this operation brought Canadian law enforcement in bringing down the family, they would unravel the Rizzuto hierarchy. The family's top men were discovered to be Niccolo Rizzuto, Consigliere Paolo Renda, and underboss Rocco Solicito. There were also three well-regarded enforcers seen at the Consenza, Lorenzo Giordano, Francesco Arcadi, and an especially infamous man, Francesco Del Balzo. Del Balzo was a violent and cold enforcer who paid no heed to consequence or the law. He would often threaten his victims over the phone, acknowledging he was being recorded without care. In one infamous February 2004 call, Del Balzo threatened a local tool rental company owner who owed the family a 6K loan. You know when you're gonna pay the bill? Who are you? Hey? Who are you? The guy that's gonna make you eat out of a straw for six months if you don't go pay him. I beg your pardon? You hear me? I know you have me on tape, don't worry about it. Just go pay the bill, okay? The businessman would laugh Del Balzo's threats off, and as a result, he would send a soldier down to the shop to beat the owner. Except, the soldier got lost in a large office park and the attack was called off. A settlement was peacefully negotiated. As the family continued their operations, however, the RCMP would begin building their case against the Rizzuto organization, and something big was coming. In 2005, Francesco del Balzo would arrange for 1,300 kilos of coke to be transported alongside Richard Griffin, a member of West Montreal's Irish street gang. However, the shipment was intercepted in a town near Montreal named Boucherville. 
Griffin, who'd invested over 1.5 million in the deal, was angry the Rizzutos hadn't taken any extra precautions while moving the product and demanded 350,000 in compensation. When Griffin refused to budge and accept the situation on July 12th of 2006, a group of Rizzuto soldiers would open fire on his home in Notre Dame de Grasse, killing him. Only a month later, a family enforcer named Domenico Macri was shot to death in a drive-by shooting right in the city's downtown. He was a protege of Del Balzo, and to this day, the circumstances of his murder remain unknown. As this wave of gang violence hit Montreal, the RCMP would finally begin to unveil Project Colise in the one million plus hours of conversations that they taped during it. The operation cost the RCMP 35 million and took place across four years between 2002 and 2006. On the morning of November 22nd, 2006, over 700 authorities across Montreal would raid offices, warehouses, and homes. 90 men were arrested, including Niccolo, Paolo, Rocco, and El Balzo. The government brought down over 1,000 charges on the 90 defendants. Of these, gangsterism, corruption, tax evasion, gambling, extortion, and more. Of the men arrested, almost every single one pled guilty, and over $4 million were seized from the Rizzuto organization. Operations ranging from drug trades, illegal gambling games, online bookmaking, and more were all shut down by the Fed. The blow to the family was severe and brutal. On September 18 of 2008, Rizzuto would plead guilty, but only a month later was released, as the prosecution couldn't get the charges to stick. Paolo Renda pleaded guilty in September of 2008, but was paroled in February of 2010. Rocco Solicito pleaded guilty in September of 2008 and was released in 2011. Del Balzo actually received one of the most serious indictments in the case, getting a 15-year sentence. However, he was released in 2017. In the fallout of the Colisee, a wave of brutality hit the streets of Montreal. On September 7 of 2007, Francesco Velenosi, a 56-year-old family capo and associate of Francesco Arcadi and Del Balzo, was found in his trunk, stabbed to death. On January 15 of 2008, a few months later, Constantine Alavizos was shot to death outside a halfway house in Ontario. At the time, he was serving a three-year-long sentence for drug trafficking and was accused of stealing 600 grand from the Rizzuto organization. Alavizos was an old associate to Gaetano Panipinto, a family lieutenant who was murdered back in October of 2000. Penapinto had a rough falling out with the Calabrian Indrangheta and became a major liability for Vito Rizzuto, who had him whacked. Ironically enough, Penapinto owned a discount coffin business in Toronto. In December of 2008, a soldier named Mario Marabella was kidnapped in Laval, a suburb of Montreal. He was being convicted at the time on numerous gang-related charges, his largest indictment being related to a 1992 liquor truck hijacking. He pleaded guilty to the hijacking, and on that fateful 2008 night, was forced into a minivan and never seen again. His car was found nearby, set on fire. On January 16, 2009, a coke dealer named Sam Fazulo was shot multiple times after being convicted for his role in a St. Leonard drug trafficking ring. Two nights later, he passed away in the hospital. He was only 37 at the time. On August 21st of that same year, Federico Del Pescio was shot by an unknown gunman in a parking lot in Ahuntsic, Quebec. The hit, like many of the other ones committed by the Rizzuto family during the fallout of Colisee, was done brazenly in public. Del Pescio, only 59 at the time, died in the hospital. Just after Christmas of 2009, Vito Rizzuto's son, Nick Jr., was shot to death in Notre Dame de Grasse as at that time, he was the Rizzuto family's street captain. It was a large and humiliating blow to the family and a sign of its growing dysfunctionality. On May 10, 2010, Renda went missing and was never found again. In June of that same year, Agustino Contrera, a member of the Contrera Carauna clan, and allegedly at the time, the acting boss of the Rizzuto family, was murdered. 
Shortly after 4 p.m. that day, two men in a black Impala would drive up to a food warehouse in St. Magloire and open fire on Contrera and his bodyguard. Contrera, who'd participated in the murder of Paolo Violi decades prior, was 66 at the time. In September of 2010, Ennio Bruni, Francesco Del Balzo's former bodyguard, was shot to death around 3 a.m. The shooting took place at a bar in Lavelle and took place less than a year following a previous attempt in 2009. Then, the biggest blow to the Rizzuto clan would take place on November 10 of 2010. That day, at around 5.40 p.m., Niccolo Rizzuto would be standing in his mansion in a Hunsik Cartierville on Mafia Road. As he stood near a large window with his family, a man wielding a high-power sniper rifle would hide in the woods behind his home, waiting for the right moment. As the 86-year-old man stood near the window, the gunman would position his weapon and open fire. They rushed him off to the hospital, where he was pronounced dead. The patriarch of Canada's most powerful crime syndicate was dead, his killer unknown, and his successor behind bars. The once organized crime in the city had quickly fallen into shattered pieces, and everyone wanted their own share. On January 31st, 2011, around lunchtime, Antonio Di Salvo was found shot dead in his garage. The killer and the motive remain unknown. On September 16 of 2011, Desjardins was driving on Levesque Boulevard in Lavelle when his SUV received multiple shots through the front windshield, aimed at his head. Although he wasn't killed in the hit, it did carry heavy implications, as many of the deaths between 2009 and 2010 were of his doing. He'd attempted a coup against the Rizzuto clan during that period, and was one of the central suspects behind planning the murder of Niccolo Rizzuto, and the family wanted revenge. On October 24th of that year, Lorenzo Lopresti, a 40-year-old former associate of the family who turned against them, was found shot dead on the floor-level balcony of his Cote Vertu condo. Lopresti was the son of Joe Lopresti, who was murdered all the way back in 1992. By that point in the year, Lorenzo was the 33rd confirmed homicide in Montreal. On March 1st of 2012, Giuseppe Colapelle was found shot dead in his vehicle in St. Leonard. Colapelle, who was 38 at the time, ran a gambling house alongside Francesco del Balzo. The two men worked alongside Mario Marabella, who went missing years prior. It was also speculated that Colapelle worked alongside Desjardins, who was on the family's hit list. In May of 2012, Giuseppe Renda, a Rizzuto associate who ran illegal gambling operations, went missing and was never found. Renda was one of the people who'd supported the hit on Niccolo Rizzuto as he worked with New York Bonanno boss Salvatore Montagna. Montagna was attempting a takeover of the family, like Desjardins, and it's speculated that he was the person who attempted to assassinate the rebellious lieutenant. Something big would happen around that time on October 5th of 2012. Vito Rizzuto was released from prison in the United States. The state deported the mafioso to Toronto almost immediately, and after returning to Canada, he stayed low. He began to meet with the mob leaders from New York as he got back into the game, before moving to Montreal. There, he would purchase an armored car and hide out in a guarded apartment. However, Rizzuto also brought a wild vengeance with him. On the 5th of November, about a month after Vito's release, Giuseppe De Malo was shot to death while going for a walk in Blainville. Malo, an old-school mobster and diplomat, was Desjardins' brother-in-law. On December 8, another month later, Emilio Cordiglione was shot to death in Ahuntsic. Cordiglione was Montreal's 33rd homicide that year and would be just one in a violent wave of murder as Rizzuto began to seize what was once his. In January of 2013, Desjardins' brother-in-law, Gaetan Gosselin, and his associate, Vincenzo Shuderi, were both murdered in front of the rebellious man's home. In May of 2013, two Rizzuto associates were found dead in a garbage dump all the way in Palermo, Italy. The body of one of the men was burnt and sprayed with bullet fire, and two months later, one of Desjardins' allies, Giuseppe De Vito, was poisoned with cyanide in his prison cell. 
He had originally received one of the longest prison sentences as a result of Project Colise. Only four days later, Salvatore Collotti was shot while taking a drive in Vaughan, Ontario. The reason for his death was likely due to the murder of Panepinto 13 years prior. Earlier, in January of that year, a member of the Rizzuto family, named Moreno Gallo, then 67 years old, was deported to Mexico by the Canadian government. Gallo, who aligned with Desjardins' coup back in 2009, was also a suspect in Niccolo Rizzuto's murder, and as such, he had to go. While sitting inside a restaurant in Acapulco, a gunman would enter the establishment and shoot him to death. On December 18 of 2013, Desjardins' ally, Roger Valiquet Jr., who worked in loan sharking, was shot down in a Laval parking lot killing him where he stood. Then almost as soon as he'd come back, he'd go as well. On December 23rd of 2013, Rizzuto would pass away at the Sacré-Cœur Hospital in Cartierville at the age of 67. It was announced that he'd naturally passed away due to his illness, but there was a lot of speculation regarding this claim, namely due to the fact that an autopsy was never conducted. Rizzuto's funeral was held in downtown Montreal's Little Italy, attended by some 800 people. With the boss now gone, and the mafia in disarray, things would die down around Montreal, and for the longest time, it seemed like the old Rizzuto clan was done for. But that simply wasn't the case. Although both Niccolo and Vito Rizzuto were gone, it didn't mean the end for the Rizzuto clan. Following Vito's death, it became an accepted theory that his successor was his son Leonardo, who worked alongside Stefano Solacito, the son of Rocco Solacito. Regardless of who the official boss was, however, Vito's wave of revenge refused to seize. In April of 2014, 56-year-old Carmine Verducci was shot to death outside a sports cafe in the suburban town of Woodbridge, Ontario. By the time police got to the parking lot, the man was already dead. Verducci, who acted as a messenger for the Calabrian Indrangheta, had been wiretapped back in 2008, and as a result, had accidentally exposed a massive 40-man Indrangheta cell in Ontario. This, and the fact that the Rizzuto organization saw him as a territorial threat, ultimately led to his demise. At the very beginning of August 2014, Dukarn Joseph was shot dead in the street. Joseph was the 46-year-old leader of the 67s, a Haitian street gang based in Montreal. Police and first responders showed up to the bloody scene in the streets of St. Michel, only to find the man dead. The reason most likely being his involvement in the death of Niccolo Jr. back in 2009. Then, on February 12 of 2016, Francesco Del Balzo would finally step out of jail a free man. He was met with a bizarre and very different criminal landscape, and with the old leadership gone and an unknown, disorganized one in play, Del Balzo wanted a bigger piece of the puzzle. He re-entered the family and began to try and grow his operations in a major power grab that the new managers would not take lightly. Leonardo and Stefano would undergo a series of legal troubles near the end of 2015, when the two men were arrested alongside 40 others due to a drug trafficking conspiracy that took place in 2013. Following this, in March of 2016, Lorenzo Giordano, a higher up in the family, was shot down in a parking lot in Chaumadie, Quebec. Only a few days later, Rocco Solicito was shot to death in his car in Lavelle. Solicito was the family's underboss at the time, and his death likely came as a result of the removal of Vito's generation. The newer, younger generation of gangsters wanted full control, and in order for that to happen, the old school had to go. Following the deaths of these two men, Del Balzo was taken back into custody as a protective measure, as Quebec officials believed he was next on the chopping block. Francesco Arcadi saw a similar situation. On May 6 of 2017, two men would break into Del Balzo's residence in Laval and assault his wife and son. Three years later, two more attempted hits would be conducted on him, although neither was successful. 
Across 2016 and 2017, more Italian gangsters and members of the Rizzuto clan were found dead, being shot at restaurants, at home, and one man in Mexico. The victim in question here was Danielle Ranieri, a gangster who ran the family's crew in Toronto. He was involved in a 2013 murder and fled to Mexico in 2015. There, he was found shot to death in a ditch. In December of 2016, Desjardins received a massive 14-year prison sentence due to the 2011 murder of Salvatore Montagna, the boss of the Bonanno family at that time. As stated earlier, Montagna and Desjardins were both vying for power in Montreal. Now in 2018, Leonardo and Stefano walked out of prison with a court acquittal. In May of 2018, Salvatore Scopa was brazenly shot to death in the lobby of a Sheraton hotel in Lavelle. Then, only a year later, his brother Andrew was found shot to death in a parking lot in Montreal's West Island. His death was immediately confirmed on the scene. Of course, the ongoing struggle in Quebec didn't just affect the Rizzuto organization, but the gangsters in Ontario too, most notably the Musitano organization. At the time, the gang was run by Pat Musitano and his brother Angelo, as they were the sons of the former boss. By 2017, however, Angelo had left his life of crime after a stint in prison and turned to religion, now a devout Christian. This didn't matter, however, as old scores needed to be settled. With their allies in the Rizzuto clan dead, this gave their enemies the opportunity to strike. In May of 2017, Angelo was shot to death in his driveway in Waterdown, and on July 10th of 2020, Pat was shot to death in a Burlington strip plaza, and most people speculate that the reason he was killed was due to one of his associates secretly betraying him. Had the Rizzuto clan stayed more intact and stable around this time, it's likely both men would still be running the family till today. As of the most recent Rizzuto-related hits, on February 9th of 2022, Domenico Macri, a sports bar owner in LaSalle who worked in illegal gambling with the family, was shot to death in a drive-by outside his home. On March 15th of the next year, Leonardo Rizzuto survived an attempted hit in Lavelle when a man would pull up by his car and open fire several times at it. Del Balzo was one of the main suspects in ordering the job. Only two months later, Claudia Iacono, the daughter-in-law to Moreno Gallo, was shot to death outside of her spa in Cote de Neige. Her father-in-law was murdered in Mexico many years prior due to his betrayal of the Rizzuto family. Iacono's murder went against the norm and completely threw mob tradition out the window, making it a very strange one. The most recent hit as of this documentary was of Del Balzo, who would finally see his inevitable fate on June 5th of 2013. That morning, Del Balzo would be walking out of the lobby of the Monster Gym in Dorval, Quebec. Their unknown gunmen would open fire on him, killing him instantly. They fled the site and as of this documentary, have yet to be identified. It's unknown what the future of organized crime in Montreal is or will be. However, most historians and crime specialists agree that a noticeable comeback is taking shape as old scores are settled. How this once powerful, feared, and vicious organization, led by its ruthless leadership, will adapt to a very different landscape now is uncertain. What is certain, however, is that the gangs that controlled the streets of Montreal are going nowhere. Always love for